All right, let's move further. Ah, oh, damn it. Uh, an article written by Moyer here, lab columnist Imre Boros. Uh, I despise the title and I'll explain why. Remix News, there is no left and right, only globalists and patriots, he says. The right and left uh, mantras can be traced back to real, earlier, but now far outdated historical roots. To understand the terms, one must recall the historical development of the system of capitalism. Capitalism is based on the continuous and irreconcilable conflict of interest of two societal groups, the owners and the workers. The struggle between the two opposing interest groups has historically been waged within national confines. Even then, there was a nation-state, such as Imperial Germany, where the importance of social peace between the two interest groups was recognized. Chancellor Bismarck's reforms exemplified this. According to Marx, the free competitive phase of capitalism began to be replaced at an accelerated pace by the internationalization of large corporations. The contemporary monetary system, uh, gold-based or standard, also provided an opportunity for this as the movement of money uh, was free of restrictions. Translated into the language of politics, the capitalist class was ahead of the working class when it occupied position on the international scale, so it globalized while labor remained within the nation-state framework. Uh, the globalization of capital after World War II, with the dollar becoming the world's dominant currency, took major strides forward as all barriers to globalist private money quickly disappeared. Privatization, deregulation and liberalization have become the slogans. And uh, at the national level, the two political viewpoints are becoming increasingly more polarized, but it is, now longer, it is no longer appropriate to label them right-wing and left-wing. The political debate has long moved on from these outdated terms. Based on the example of the US, the Republican Party is said to be right-wing and to prioritize American interests. However, this was not the case with many of uh, uh, their presidents, including the entire Bush family, McCain and Mitt Romney. The German CDU, after Helmut Kohl, still claims to be right-wing and Christian, but who would dare say it has behaved in a patriotic or Christian way over the past decade? It is time for the left and right political divisions in public discourse to be replaced by globalists and patriots, ignoring the old mantra, and we should not be afraid to name the globalists based on their actions and statements, whether they proclaim themselves to belong to the left or to the right. Now, I have no idea what is the target audience of this column. Uh, I mean, if it is uh, working class Hungarians, I guess. Okay, fine. It is mm -hmm. uh, because it is a highly rudimentary analysis. And uh, mm -hmm. if the purpose is to print it on propaganda leaflets, yeah, sure, meh, whatever. I mean, you know, if I were the political strategist of Fides, for instance, and I would see this and, oh, look, we want to print this and uh, distribute it in the villages. And, mm, not great, not terrible. Yeah, sure, print it. Go ahead. Yeah, I would give the okay for it. But if this is to be printed in a slightly more intellectual setting than that, uh, no, <laughs> no, because no, <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Uh, definitely not, because um, well, first of all, who is to say that globalism can't have its own right wing and left wing? No, definitely globalism has it has already has and has been having a left wing since at least 1917. We used mm -hmm. to call it international socialism. <laughs> you know, Ines Armand explained about that, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin explained things like that. I mean, it's not something new. It's been 105 years already, mm -hmm. right? So you know, if anything, the glo globalism has had a left wing, so to speak, uh, for many, many decades, over 100 years. So that's one aspect. So you know, the, this rudimentary analysis doesn't even consider, doesn't even uh, pondered the question on whether maybe it's a bit more complicated than that because it is. Uh, that's one aspect. Second aspect, uh, the, the author correctly observes that there are individuals or leaders or even entire political parties that profess to become, uh, to be part of the right, but ending up being, well, leftists. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there, is there any doubt that Angela Merkel was a center-left leader? Really? Well, who? Who exactly doubts about that? Right? Uh, and he said, well, but who is to, who dare to say that let's say they will behave in a patriotic or Christian way? Uh, well, okay, fair enough. But since when did Cedeu over the last 20 years claim it is patriotic? Nothing. And yes, you can say, well, but they're not exactly Christian either, maybe. Although, again, Angela Merkel was raised in a very religious family. Uh, but you have to understand that the way Christian, the word Christian is understood, can vary from region to region. Mm. Uh, the Western 
Catholic understanding of Christianity is, a, is globalistic in nature. That's why it has only one government, right? Vat Vatican City. Whereas the Eastern and Southern understanding of Christian is not exactly globalistic. It's, you know, especially in Orthodoxy, it's obviously national. <laughs> right? yeah. in, in, the, in the Orthodox rite, uh, the so-called Eastern rite, um, you know, the, there is the Apostolic Armenian Church, then there is the Apostolic... Then, then there is, you know, Apostolic Armenian Church is actually outside of the whole circle, because, you know, we're the first Christians, and we don't want anything to do with your modernism. You're, you're too progressive. <laughs> and then there is the national churches, uh, with the, the Russian Church being uh, the biggest one, but then, of course, there is the Greek, the Romanian, and whatnot, um, more recently the Ukrainian. <clears throat> mm. And all of those are, you know, c convening into a board of directors, essentially, with the nominal chief being the Patriarch of Constantinople, right? who is the first amongst equals, so, you know, he's not exactly the Pope. I mean, if the Patriarch of Constantinople says something, that, that doesn't incur any obligation for anyone in the Orthodox world to agree or to submit or to... not really, no. Okay? So, Already the understanding of Christian is divided and has been divided for more than 1,200 years. You know, everyone says the schism started, it happened in 1054. That's, that's a bit arbitrary. In reality, it started about 200 years earlier mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a gradual process. And 1054 wasn't even the pinnacle of it. I mean, the schism essentially start, um, stopped, uh, became a definitive process after 1120. But in any mm. event, uh, so this, there's that. And then since then, there have been further developments into the word Christian. Martin Luther being the first uh, visible one, <laughs> then the Calvinists, uh, right? Uh, and then, of course, the other Protestant um, denominations. And then, of course, starting from the 19th century, the Neo-Protestant movements. So the word Christian today doesn't have a one understanding. It has quite a few, quite a few of them. Uh, some would say several thousands of understandings. I wouldn't say several thousands because they all fall into larger categories, but there are at least 10 different understandings on what Christian is, especially in relation to politics, because that matters, because we're talking mm -hmm. politics here. So, you know, Tedeu wasn't Christian by uh, Mr. B Imre Boros's definition, and I would argue by my definition as well. Sure. But who is to say that he wasn't Christian by the German definition? I mean, you know, ask Cardinal Marx what he thinks about that. Cardinal mm -hmm. Marx is a real person. His name is Marx. Um, and he's a Marxist. <laughs> he's a cardinal in the Catholic Church in, and uh, a German. Ask Cardinal Marx. He, he, he definitely thinks that he was very Christian. <laughs> who are you to disagree? I mean, you know, he's an official in the global Catholic Church. You know, maybe he has a point. I'm not saying I agree, but I am saying maybe he has a point. So mm. this um, this interpretation, that's why I'm saying it's not a good uh, interpretation for an intellectual setting or even for the general public in the sense of uh, let's try to convert new voters. No, 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 it's not a good thing precisely because it it leaves out so many nuances. Sure, give, uh, giving this to the uh, grunk voters in the rural areas, excellent, mm. good thing. Uh, but uh, for the... Um, uh, for everything else, not really, because it, it doesn't take into account these kinds of nuances that matter. They, are, they actually do matter. And it's another aspect that uh, I, has been bothering me for more than 10 years. I actually made a video about that a few years ago and said, every time I hear someone saying there is no such thing as left and right, every time, no exceptions so far, this guy isn't an exception either. The next phrase after proclaiming there is no such thing as left and right, is proposing some left-wing measures. <laughs> Always. Look it up. I mean, look it up for yourself. I, I keep on saying, I keep on challenging people. Give me one thinker of relevant importance that has come with this conclusion, with, the, with this postulate, actually, that there is no such thing as left and right, and then in the next sentence, he proposing a right-wing measure. One. It's almost impossible to find them. Now, there are a few very marginal examples, but there is not, none that even comes close to somewhat mainstream anywhere. And even this guy, right? I mean, you know, he said, oh, there is no such thing as that. It's only patriots and globalists and whatnot. 
And in the next sentence, he uh, uh, suggests um, limiting the press or um, regulating corporations and whatnot, which is inherently a left-wing measure. Now, you can say that you can do regulation right, or you can, sure, I agree, I'm, I'm not rigid enough to say, well, I, nothing can be done. Of course, something can be done. But what I'm saying is that uh, he also argues it in left-wing terms. Even though I mean, he defines free enterprise in Bismarckian and Marxian terms, <laughs> uh, what? Uh, really? I mean, if there is, if there is no such thing as left wing and right wing, uh, it's only patriots and globalists. But uh, this guy, presumably, he defines himself as a patriot, right? Uh, defines things in Bismarckian and Marxian terms. Then I, I want nothing whatsoever to do with you guys. <laughs> Yeah, but even leaving that aside, uh, okay, you can uh, you can have a discussion on uh, globalism uh, versus pay versus patriotism in terms of the economy as a parallel discussion. But uh, uh, sure, but, sure. but but saying that uh, but, but saying that uh, that there is no left or right and that has been uh, that has been sublimated uh, by uh, globalism or, or or patriotism that as well doesn't work uh, that way. Yeah. Um, <sighs> I mean, just a few weeks ago, or less than a week ago, I started a discussion on Facebook uh, with food supply chains. And I was noticing that, for instance, in Romania, the top 20 retailers, food retailers, none of them are Romanian, inside Romania. So, well, look, look, problem. I actually think that's a problem. And I was comparing it, you know, with our neighbors. You know, the main supplier, the main retailer in Ukraine is Ukrainian. Uh, the main retailer in Poland is not Polish, but the second, third, and fourth, and fifth are Polish. Um, the main retailer in Bulgaria is Bulgarian. The main retailer in Sweden is Swedish. The main retailer in Finland is Finnish. The main retailer in Britain is British. The main retailer in Spain is Spanish, and so on and so forth. Right? And I say, look, it's probably a good thing to have, if not the first, at least the second, the third, I mean, the, generally speaking, the market to be driven mostly locally, especially when it comes to food. Yeah, when, because it, comes, when food it comes to strategic and national yes. security. Yeah, areas. because food security is a national security issue. Mm -hmm. You can disagree with my opinion, but if we accept that there is such thing as a national security, and if there is such thing as strategic national interest, if we accept these two, then we must accept that energy security, food security, these are strategic interests of a nation or of a group. Mm -hmm. You can even be talked at the regional level, that's okay. I don't think that's necessarily a nationalistic talking point, because again, I said even can be done regionally <coughs> in cooperation, let's say cooperate, uh, I don't know, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland and Romania, you know, regionally, that's okay. But it's not necessarily a nationalistic talking point, it is not necessarily um, economically right-wing, but it's definitely politically right-wing, because mm -hmm. when you emphasize these kinds of strategic, that's fundamentally a right-wing position, because on the left, if we remember, and it's been the case since forever, on the left is, um, let's all sing Kumbaya. Let us not forget, just in 87, for instance, the left in Germany was arguing for complete demilitarization, and the left in the United States was arguing for the West to simply renounce its, all of its nuclear pro programs, military nuclear programs, uh, and you know, just basically disarmament in front of the Soviet Union. That's the standard on, on the left. Mm -hmm. Let us not defend ourselves. Maybe we don't deserve to be defended or you know, various intellectual gobbledygook around this idea. Mm -hmm. Whether it's done cynically because they work for the enemy, and that's usually the case, <laughs> uh, whether it's done out of naivete and stupidity, or or maybe it's done because uh, they actually think that uh, uh, th that way they can lower the level of violence on the world, which is a naive uh, view. But okay, fine. Let's say they believe that. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not. I don't care what their intention is. What I'm. What I say is that the left has fundamentally different interests than the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but getting back to your example uh, with, uh, with with the food retailers. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, well, but I say that when that when when it comes to the to to these, not not exactly niche, but uh, but strategically important things, you can't you can't exactly discuss them on uh, on political grounds because um, uh, because see in this case everybody needs food, mm. uh, everybody needs electricity, everybody needs running water. If you want to pretend to to have a civilized society, mm. 
the, or, or, or at least what adapted to the modern times. Mm -hmm. um, quasi civilized. Quasi civilized, <laughs> yeah. Uh, those can be those can be exactly discussed uh, on uh, on whether the approach will be either right wing or left wing or um, patriotic or globalist. Um, because because here is for here is one example uh, of a of a of a globalist take on food security. The United Arab Emirates uh, hold, holds a lot of hectares in eastern in Eastern Europe exactly to secure the their food reserve because you you look at it geographically they live in a bloody desert. Mm -hmm. What happens if uh, if at one point the water runs out? Well. Then you're, you're 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 kind of screwed. What happens if the water runs out on the entire in the entire part of the Middle East? Or for example, uh, electricity gets cut or war starts and they and um, and you need electricity to power the, the desalination plants. You 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 don't have water for your population. You don't have water for your agriculture. However, how much agriculture you can have in the middle of meager desert? Meager as it is. Yeah. Meager, me, meager as it is, uh, and uh, wholly dependent on a single point of failure. Uh, they they have this approach. Let's buy a lot of land uh, in places where you, where you can do proper agriculture, in order to in order to prepare for that. So so here's my fear. Here, here's what getting back to what I said in the beginning. Uh, uh, um, these issues of nas of national security and of great importance uh, to a nation can't be uh, can be interpreted on uh, on. On, on, strictly on, on, patriotic or strictly on, globalistic, yeah, and and, and, on, and on which side of the political compass you're on. Yeah. Uh, now they can be sometimes. I mean, you know, uh, the left wing take on food security in United Arab Emirates, for instance, would be: uh, let's have the state use uh, uh, some of the oil income to subsidize agriculture locally. Now that would be stupid because it would be it would bankrupt the state because you can't do agriculture <laughs> in the desert. I mean, you can, but not you so can, much. But at great cost. And at mm. great cost. So I, I guess that would be a left wing take on uh, on that. Whereas the right wing would see would be: let's buy our food security from where it can be bought mm -hmm. um, so it's a more capitalistic take for sure but yeah you, you can't judge it in purely patriotic I mean is the government of UAE unpatriotic because it buys land in Ukraine mm -hmm. um, or is the government of UAE globalistic because it buys uh, it just doesn't fit I mean you know, yeah. it's uh, trying to square <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't work like, like that. Like trying to push the square for the circle hole. Through the circle hole. Yeah, I mean, it, it just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why this kind of analysis, and that's why I'm always annoyed when I see these kinds of titles, especially from right-wingers. I can understand why the left-wingers are doing, because the left, just like the devil, has its... Uh, uh, one of the main missions is to try to convince you that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. right? Because once you start uh, naming the leftist, you know, this guy says, name the globalist. No, no, no name the leftist. Once you start naming the leftists, then it becomes clear and it becomes easier to predict their moves and it becomes harder for them to do anything. Because once anyone, everyone ex expects their actions, they start preparing for that, they start uh, implementing countermeasures and so on and so forth. That's why the international left always, um, uh, not, not always, I mean since 1990 definitely, has tried its, its best to avoid discussing about its international reach and invested heavily manpower uh, wisdom money a lot of money to try to convince as many people that the international leftism doesn't exist because if you don't think international leftism exists then it's easier for the international left to operate mm -hmm. it's that easy um and um again that, that's one of the reasons why globalism per se can be assimilated to the left almost always um, I, I even made a video about that, globalization versus globalism. You know, globalization is pretty libertarian in the sense that anyone who wants to participate in globalization is free to do it. Anyone who doesn't want to participate in globalization is also free to do it. You know, nothing is mandatory. There, there is no international driving on the right uh, organization. You know? <laughs> yeah, most, most countries, most places, most jurisdictions elected to drive on the right, but there are quite a few who elected not to, and that's mm -hmm. okay. Uh, same thing with um, you know, uh, plug sockets, uh, plug outlets. There are uh, several dozens of standards mm -hmm. out there. There is no international uh, plug outlet society that, uh, <laughs> uh, or organization 
organization that tries to regulate how uh, electricity is being distributed. Heck, not, not even the, the standards are the same. I mean, North America uses 110 volts. Uh, Japan uses 100. Uh, Japan 100, um, Europe 100, uh, 220, 200, 220. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, even inside Africa, there are differences. Um, it's not even the, the, you know, in Africa, not even the same continent uses the same standard. No, <laughs> no not really, no. Mm -hmm. uh, and not all of them drive on the same side, <laughs> speaking of which. Uh, same thing in Asia. I mean, you know, India drives on the left, uh, but some, most of its neighbors don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no, or, or even better, the example of China. The rest of me and China drives on the left, uh, Hong Kong drives on the right. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, things happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's globalization. You know, mm -hmm. uh, countries do learn. Uh, countries and individuals and groups learn from each other and uh, adapt to their local uh, conditions. And um, you know, sometimes honks happen, but it is what mm -hmm. it is, and they are all accepted. That's globalization. Globalism is uh, you know when the Wuhan honk organization comes in and tells you, oh, you all should be wearing muzzles. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to say no. Well, of course you can say no, as evidence that I did. But it carries a cost to say no, because it's quasi-mandatory. Right? That's globalism. And yes, I uh, share the sentiment that globalism is, generally speaking, haram, generally speaking, harmful, generally speaking, a terrible idea. But to say that the existence of globalism per se means the obliteration of left-wing and right-wing considerations and anyone who disagrees with globalism necessarily has to be a patriot in some way shape or form um, mm. Mm -mm. no mm -mm. i mean let, let's put it this way uh we both speak several foreign languages four five six uh, mm -hmm. even more right we both lived on two or three continents. Right? Yep. Um, we both hold skills that are much more useful on the international uh, market than in the city we happen to be living in right now. Mm -hmm. Is, would that be fair to say? So does that make us globalists? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. And if that if that is the case, then that means that I'm not allowed to talk against the World Health Organization to say they suck. Oh, am I not allowed to criticize Klaus Schwab because he's a fellow globalist? Really? <laughs> and that's definitely not the case. So if that's not the case, then that means either I'm not a globalist or maybe, just maybe, it's a bit more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, I, you know, individuals can be uh, patriots or not exactly patriots or patriotic, but not necessarily globalist. That's what I'm saying. I mean, let me put it in another way. Uh, did the Jews in, Bas in Basarabia, were they globalists or not really? I don't know. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. You know, they, they used everything that they could there, and they did a lot of shilling for patriotic purposes. But when Stalin wanted to put them into the trains, they were like, actually, no. And they ran away. Hmm. That, that, does that, that, did that make them un unpatriotic? I don't know. Maybe. But can you blame them? Mm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you voluntarily go on the train right towards Siberia? <laughs> yeah, I mean, would you? I don't know, maybe you would. Uh, I, I know I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. Um, same thing, you know, I, I like the country I was born in. I like living here. I really do. But would I stay here in any conditions, considering the skills that I have and the abilities that I have? The answer is obviously no. I don't know. Patriotism at any cost? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. It depends. It depends on the circumstances. It depends. Um, what do I have to lose? And some, uh, some things are worth losing. Some things are not. Sure, I agree. And judging everything strictly on this very limited and not, not outdated, but rather improper set of lens of only globalism versus patriotism is wrong. Don't fall for the, I mean, th this is basically polarization coming from our side, but done mm -hmm. wrongly. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a big fan of polarization, don't, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. 
but done correctly. This one is done wrongly. I mean, the, mar the Margot here lap uh, columnist is just doing things wrongly. Hopefully it will pay off in the elections, because <laughs> obviously it's an article shilling for Fides for the upcoming elections in April. Um, so, you know, hopefully it pays off in the elections, but don't fall for this kind of shilling. I'm just saying. And uh, when I say don't fall for this kind of shilling, I mean, you know, question it, think it through, because, you know, the answer is not outright rejecting anything he says, but definitely the answer is not uh, either, oh, anyone who disagrees with me is a globalist. Go, go, go. <laughs> uh -uh. Uh -uh. Sticking around in Hungary, Al Jazeera, Hungary's leader denounced in Bosnia for anti-Muslim rhetoric. Bosnian officials and religious leaders have denounced suggestions voiced by Hungarian Prime Minister Orban Viktor for, and his spokesman that the integration of Bosnia and Herzegovina into the EFRA Soyuz will be challenging because of its large Muslim population. Uh, Orban's spokesman Zoltan Kovac has tweeted that the challenge with Bosnia is how to integrate a country with 2 million Muslims. During his long speech on Tuesday in Budapest, the right-wing populist Orban said Hungary supports Bosnia's EU bid, adding that as an EU member, Hungary had to mobilize a lot of energy to overcome the enlargement fatigue that has taken hold of the European Union. <clears throat> I'm doing my best to convince Europe's great leaders that the Balkans may be further away from them than from uh, Hungary. But how we manage the security of a state in which 2 million Muslims live is a key issue for their security too. Reaction in Bosnia on Wednesday was sharp, with some Bosniak parties asking for a ban on Orban's planned official visit to Sarajevo, and the head of Islamic community, Grand Mufti Hussein Kav Kavazovic, uh, calling his statement xenophobic and waste. If such ideologies become the basis on which the policies of a united Europe are based, then it takes us back to the times when the European unity was built on, the, on similar fascist, Nazi, violent and genocidal ideologies that led to the Holocaust and the other horrific crimes, he said in a statement. Mate, your Bosniak Muslims served in the SS. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> the Bosniak members of the country's tripartite presidency, Shefik Zaferovic, uh, called Orban's statements shameful and rude. It is not a challenge for the EU to integrate 2 million Bos Bosnian Muslims because we are an, an indigenous European people who have always lived here and we are Europeans, he said, <laughs> fact true. Uh, Bosnia, which is made up of Bosniaks, Serbs and Croats, is going through its gravest political crisis since the end of the civil war in the 1990s. With tacit support from Russia and Serbia, Bosnian Serbs are threatening uh, to form their own army, judiciary and tax authority reviving fears of another bloody breakup of the Balkan country. During his speech on Tuesday, Orban said Hungary would not support EU sanctions against Bosnian Serb leader Milorad Dodik as threatened by Germany and some other member states because of his separatist stand. And Sarajevo has lost its nerve and it is attacking everyone, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia and now Hungary, not to mention Russia, Dodik said on Wednesday, referring to support he has allegedly received from those countries. Orban has been known for his anti-migration policies, claiming Muslim migrants are the greatest threat to Europe's Christian values. He has also been supporting the quick accession of Serbia into the EU, despite the increasingly hardline policies of his ally, Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic. Uh, more than 100,000 people were killed and millions were left homeless in the Bosnian War, when Bosnian Serbs tried to create an ethnically pure territories in order to join them with neighboring Serbia. Okay. <laughs> Friendly reminder, the headquarters of Al Jazeera Europe is located located in Sarajevo. It's a beautiful <laughs> building in downtown Sarajevo. I'm serious, it's a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. uh, very modern, modernistic, but with fashion, with taste. It's not the kind of modernistic building that uh, you see in uh, Western Europe. Of, co of course, because it's because it's made with Qatari money, not... Uh, yes. um, no, not, not with Evro Soyuz money, using brutalist <laughs> Soviet true. architecture. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect why Al Jazeera International is suddenly very interested in what happens in Bosnia. Right. Uh, generally speaking, no one cares what happens in Bosnia. Even Bosniaks don't care what happens in Bosnia. Right? Uh, but Sarajevo is, uh, well, their hometown uh, on this continent. So obviously they're very interested because, you know, uh, let's just say that if a war breaks out there, um, the headquarters of Al Jazeera is maybe not the first target, but definitely in the top five. Okay. So there is that. <clears throat> then there is um, the statement by... Um, Orban, which, uh, unlike other statements that he made about Muslims, this one is probably the most bland of them. Uh, he's like, yeah, sure, we kind of support Bosnia joining the Evro Soyuz too, but let us have an idea on what to work on integrating 2 million Muslims. Is that really such a bad thing? 
I mean, let's not forget when the uh, when the issue uh, not necessarily with Romania it wasn't an issue, but with Bulgaria it was. Hmm. Same thing. Well, yeah, but they have a lot of Muslims there. You know, let's see how they manage the population there and whatnot. And when everyone saw that clearly there isn't an issue, then okay, ticked on the box. Okay, so the, there, will, there won't be a Muslim question uh, when it comes to Bulgaria. Okay, next item on the list. Same thing here. Is that a terrible thing to ask? Well, I guess if you live in the hypersensitive Twitter bubble, <laughs> I guess that's a problem. But, you know, amongst uh, real statesmen, it's not. It's a serious element of, not even of concern, but, you know, you have to ask about it. Hmm? Now, on the other hand, um, uh, outside of uh, the re of Musti Hussein Kavazovic, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, Mr. Sefik Zafarovic, the, uh, the Muslim president of Bosnia, because again, there's three presidents <laughs> uh, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, he also has a point. Look, we've been here since forever. It's a European population. Uh, and he doesn't go even further to explain, but I'll say it. Uh, you know, I don't want to make the case for, Bo for Bosnians, but it's true. It's been more than 150 years when you, when you would see anything even remotely close to what we would call today Islamic violence coming from Bosniaks. It just doesn't happen. It's just, okay, sure, there, there were a few Bosniak citizens that joined ISIS. Yeah, there were more Finnish citizens joining um, ISIS. So, you know, I mean, it's not fair to uh, judge by that. I mean, I, I, and I'm not joking, there were 19 Bosnian citizens who joined the Islamic State. There were 23 Finnish citizens from Finland mm -hmm. joining the Islamic State. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. right? So that's not a fair judgment for sure. I mean, does that does that make Finland an Islamic state? Of course not. Okay. Uh, so, in in that sense, they do have a point to say, well, come on, mate, are you gonna seriously ask the Muslim question with Bosniaks? I mean, really? Uh, they do have a point, but they might have harmed their cause by allowing this mufti to talk unfeathered. And it's, oh, but you know, fascist, Nazi, it's basically a, that, that kind of a feminist re Take your hate speech <laughs> off my campus, right? I mean, it's, it's stupid. <laughs> it's, and it's stupid, especially coming from the Mufti of Muslim Bosniaks, who, again, were the largest Muslim squad of the SS. <laughs> I'm just saying, there's photos of it. I mean, it's, not, it's nothing uh, hidden yeah. about it. Everyone knows it's hap it happened. Nobody really denies it, I guess, with the exception of the Mufti. Or was it the sixth SS battalion? <laughs> mm -hmm, yes. So, you know, I'm, and again, I'm not saying Bosnian Muslims should be judged by that historical level. No, of course not. But what I'm saying is that the Mufti of the Bosniak Muslims should shut the fuck up <laughs> and or avoid being stupid in public. This is being stupid in public. Basically, you, you call uh, Orban Victor a Nazi. <laughs> really? Mm. Really, I mean, you know, Orban Victor, if anything, uh, not just himself, but his family, has a history of fighting against dictatorship, whereas your organization, Mr. Mufti, does not. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay? Now, on a more serious note, um, Bosnia joining the EU, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it does, but it's not going to happen. The reason I hope it does is because I'm sure uh, anyone who has followed European history, uh, whenever an empire starts integrating into the Balkans, the empire ceases to exist. Uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire started integrating things in the Balkans, and then you had the first Serbian uprising, the second Serbian uprising, the first Balkan war, the second Balkan war. Eventually the empire ceased to exist. <laughs> because they started uh, not, not just conquering, but integrating in that region. Then you had the Austrian Empire, who had a similarly genius idea. Mm -hmm. The Austrian Empire ceased to exist. Now there is the Eurosoyuz. You are here. <laughs> so, so that's why I support especially Bosnia's bid to the EU, Serbia as well, but Bosnia in particular. <laughs> precisely because of that. I mean, if the mm -hmm. Eurosoyuz starts integrating in Bosnia, in Serbia, um, we can already start the clock, uh, you know, mm. it's the final countdown for the Afro-Soyuz. <laughs> yeah, 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 it'll, it'll be funny, to, funny to, for Brussels to impose uh, feminist and LGBT rhetoric in Bosnia. <laughs> Definitely, it's, it's going to work tremendously. <laughs> we're, we're, we're probably going to see the, the, the first Bosnia suicide bombings in Brussels. <laughs> 
yeah so so you know, but, so yeah the, the, you know de definitely but, um, tr you know transgender education in bosnian schools <laughs> Smoking bans in bars. <laughs> Definitely gonna work. Uh, what else? Uh, come on, there are, a lot, there, were, there are a lot of these. Oh, yeah. Uh, mandating the Bosnian state to recognize gay marriages from the Netherlands. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Glorious. It's, uh, definitely nobody will object to that. Of course not. And the entirety of the tripartite presidency of Bosnia will definitely stamp, uh, put a stamp of approval on these oh, things. There's another one that could that, that could actually that could actually but hurt even more than uh, the recognizing same-sex marriages, uh, um, for forbidding halal slaughtering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, in fairness, uh, the, the Muslim Bosniaks do not put so much emphasis on halal as uh, as Arab Muslims, uh, so probably that won't uh, be. Um, a huge issue but uh, you know the entire framework of the common agricultural policy because you know their rural um, areas function nearly identical to the ones in Hungary and Romania and we all know how much of the Evrosayuz Zaki Communitaire is observed in Romania and Hungary and Slovakia it's not okay <laughs> let's get that out of the way it's not in fact in Slovakia a few EU inspectors ended up being beheaded uh, just for inspecting I'm just saying what do you think is going to happen in Bosnia? But then that was fertilizer. What do you think is going to happen in Bosnia? You know, with, the, with their remote villages in the middle of the mountains, where not even the roads end up all the way there. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. So that's why I support Bosnia's bid to be EU. Now, not to mention that in the case of Bosnia, you know, just joining the EU would impoverish like half of the country. Um, and you know admittedly bosnia unlike serbia doesn't have a history of rebellion on economic terms but you know never say never <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying never say never um so yeah as for Bo, what's the name zoltan kovac's statement it's not xenophobic it's definitely not racist i mean you know the, the mm -hmm. same guy who says it's racist then says well, yeah but we're a european people then it's not racist Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and at one point, being well, did uh, being Muslim become a race? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So no. Uh, not to mention that every observer of, uh, generally speaking, the Muslim world, uh, whether the observer is biased in favor of Muslims or not, they all unanimously agree that look. Well, yeah, there's the Muslim world, and then there are a few asterisks, uh, namely uh, Albania and Bosnia, which are. Yeah, they're Muslim, but not really, but they are, but they're not. Okay, so, um, the worst excesses of the Muslim world either don't exist in Bosnia or Albania, or they're outright um, reviled. Right? So, for instance, there was a scandal with the Saudi men um, marrying multiple wives in Bosnia. That was a huge scandal. It ended up with expulsions and uh, temporary mm -hmm. shutdowns of diplomatic relations. I mean, mm -hmm. they took it very seriously. And again, it was the Muslim uh, president of Bosnia who initiated the the diplomatic um, offensive against Saudi Arabia. And then, nah, you have to discipline your citizens even when they're here. No, that's not acceptable by our standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or well, funny thing, though, though, at some point now there are four of them, but uh, until very recently there were only basically two shopping malls in Sarajevo. One owned by a Saudi investor and one local. Mm -hmm. The local one was smaller and looked worse than the Saudi one, which was bigger and nice and modern and whatnot. The smaller one was always full. The big and nice one was, uh, well, not exactly mm -hmm. empty, but not exactly as crowded. <laughs> one reason. The Saudi one didn't say didn't sell alcohol. <laughs> that, that's mostly Bosniaks for you. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, we're Muslim, but you know, pork tastes good. <laughs> Vodka tastes nice. Uh, yeah, rakia is good. Nice, yeah. Rakia is good. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. even during, I mean, this article evokes the situation with the with the war against the Serbs uh, in the 1990s. Well, here's a funny story from them. Um, some of those who fought in that war, during the war, thought it would be a great idea to put out a call throughout the Muslim world to send in help for fellow Muslims in Bosnia fighting against the Serbian oppressor. 
and a few mercenaries essentially. So yeah, yeah sure, why not? Hey, free war. Um, and quite a few from Algeria showed up to help, and they did, and all great. But at the end of the war, when you know uh, the Dayton Accords were signed and whatnot, and things were people were moving on from the war situation. The Algerians, some of them were like, oh yeah, but you know, now we should establish a caliphate and uh, um, ban pork and, uh, and the Bosnian, ban, ban what? <laughs> Mate, Algeria is that way. I mean, seriously, do you want, do you want to need a lift to the airport? <laughs> and basically expelled all of them. Right? The, the newly established state expelled all of them. No, no, you, you, you don't get to bring those ideas here. They just, no, no, because no. So yeah, but again, I fully support uh, Bosnia's bid to the EU.